is that there have been waves of student activism and protest. There's nothing wrong with that. But this wave is different in that the students weren't saying this is outrageous, this is terrible, this is evil. They were saying this is dangerous. Um, if, if, this, if this person is allowed to speak, if this idea is put out uh, in a letter, it will harm members of marginalized groups, it will harm me, it will harm my friends, it will traumatize us, it will reactivate PTSD. And so there's this idea that students are fragile, so fragile that they must be protected. And that's why, so the hallmark of this new culture is the word safety. This is, and again, we're well, not blaming the students. We raised them, we'll get to this later, we raised them to be scared out of their minds. We raised them to think that danger lurked everywhere, that they were gonna be kidnapped. Um, and so for this generation, kids born after 1995 especially, we, known as Gen Z or iGen, uh, for that generation, they, they were taught to see things through the lens of safety versus danger. Now, if you come to a college campus, <clears throat> I mean, especially a place like Yale, I mean, there are literally moats around the buildings. It's a, you know, it's a very safe place physically. Um, uh, and if you interpret ideas, books, uh, uh, classes, th things said in a seminar class through the lens of, is that safe or is that dangerous? Well, they've been taught that you know, safety trumps everything. You don't, you don't mess around if it's a safety issue. Um, so this is a very, very bad way to look at the world. That's the point of our book. It's really about three bad ideas. And the first of those three bad ideas is what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. So you should not just avoid things that, are, that make you uncomfortable or make you feel challenged. Uh, you need to be protected by them, and you need to demand that the relevant authorities protect you. That's why we call it safetyism. Well, let's, let's expand on that one. I want to also drive another further point home. In the book, you write a bit about this, the way in which I think you call it concept creep mm -hmm. and the way in which words have uh, crept to mean other things. Uh, violence is, of course, one of them. This idea that right. ver words can be violent. That's it's right. something that is, is relatively new. Um, but in terms of safety and fragility, um, you borrow from the work of, of uh, Nassim Taleb yes. and uh, his, his concept of anti-fragile, mm -hmm. which I think is great and I think it's helpful. Can you expound on that a little bit here? Yeah, it is very helpful here for understanding why many students see themselves as fragile. So there's this w wonderful, wonderful concept from Nassim Taleb, the author of The Black Swan. He, he had observed after the financial crisis that there are certain systems like economic systems or banking systems that if you don't challenge them, if they're not shocked or stressed, they get fragile and then they break easily. And so he actually called the financial crisis. He saw beforehand the banking system is not is not going to be resilient if there's a shock. Um, and so he was looking around, what word do we have for the opposite of fragile? And there is no word. So he made up the word anti-fragile. And so the way to think about it is that, you know, is that like a glass, a wine glass is very fragile. And if you let your kids play with it, it's guaranteed to break and nothing good comes of that. Um, if you give them a plastic cup, it's resilient, and so they can play with it, and they'll drop it, but nothing good comes of that. It just doesn't break. It doesn't get better. Uh, and then there are certain things, not a lot of them, but there are certain very important systems in the world that will only get better if you drop them. They'll only get better if they're shocked and stressed. And so the immune system is the classic example. The immune system is an amazing system built by evolution to be ready for whatever life throws our way. And it doesn't know what to be allergic to. It doesn't know what to react to. So it has to be exposed to all kinds of dirt, dirt, germs, bacteria, and it turns out even parasitic worms. We evolved with parasitic worms. Um, and if we, keep, if we keep our immune system safe, if we protect our kids with antibacterial wipes and put them in a bubble, we warp the immune system, we prevent it from developing, and then they have a lot more autoimmune diseases, specifically peanut allergies. Peanut allergies are very rare unless you don't expose your kids to peanuts. And that's what we started doing in the 90s. We started overprotecting our kids because one in, I don't know, you know, one in a thousand or something. It was very, it was very rare yeah, until the 90s. But we started saying, oh, because some kids have peanut allergies, we have to not have any peanuts in school. If kids are not exposed to peanut proteins, the skin, it's mostly the skin of the peanut is what does it, um, their immune system doesn't learn. And that's why peanut allergies are going up so high. <laughs> well, Ricky Gervais, I'm sorry to interrupt. Ricky Gervais has a funny comedy bit. Have you seen no, this? No. It's about peanut allergies, and it's a sort of fantasy that he has about Because he went on an airplane one time, and they, they, they didn't let him eat <laughs> They didn't let him eat peanuts. He was so upset, so he... Uh, he he began to fantasize about smearing peanut dust on him before he went 
<laughs> went on a plane so that someone could have an allergic reaction and that he couldn't get blamed well, for it. Well, if it was a plane full of kids, that would probably be a good, a good uh, pro-social thing to do. But once they're adults, it's not a good thing to do. They're fragile. Yeah, exactly. Um, so let me ask you, uh, further to this point, y- you, I think you go as far back as 1979, uh, I forget the name of that that uh, that boy that was kidnapped famously in Soho yeah, area, Pates, yeah. right? Uh, but uh, but for me, it, it seems like most of w- the contributing factors here are you at least as you lay out in the book are social media. Mm-hmm. I'm very curious about that. And another one is the the heightened uh, safety environment that came out of the 9/11 attacks. Yeah. So let's uh, let's take it in in order. Um, so children, I mean, there are there are countries in which children are highly protected. If there's a lot of kidnapping in South America and some at various p- periods, people have not let their kids out because of kidnapping. But that was never the case here. Um, even during the peak of the crime wave, which was the 1970s and 80s, kids went outside to play. Um, anyway, you know, I'm 53. Anybody over 40 remembers, you know, after school, you go out and you play with your friends, and you're you know you're in the street or backyards or a park, and then you come home for dinner. That's the normal way that kids are raised. They need they need time to play, uh, and they need to be self-governing. They need to work out problems for themselves. Uh, and in the process of that, some bad things happen. They get hurt. They get in fights. And that's like being exposed to peanuts when you're kids. You have to have conflicts. You have to be able to work them out yourself. And that's how your psychological system becomes like your immune system. It gets stronger and tougher, and you're ready to go off to college and regulate your own affairs. But what we started doing, <clears throat> for a variety of reasons, some of which you just mentioned, we gradually tighten the noose around our kids, or maybe we should say we gradually tighten the protective uh, bubble around them, thinking we were helping them, but in fact we were harming them. And so the key events were, uh, there were two very high profile killings of six year old boys, uh, Aton Pates in 1979 and Adam Walsh in 1981. And cable TV came out right around then, around 1980, 81 especially. And so in the 80s, Americans were just bombarded with stories about kidnapped kids. Now. The, almost nobody, there's almost no kidnapping of kids other than by the non custodial parent. It's almost always a relative who kidnaps a kid who didn't get it. So the statistics are, it's like 0.001%. It's or about 100 kids a year. We are in three, a country of 350 million, about 100 kids a year are true kidnapped, like true kidnaps That's by a That's a lot stranger. lower than most people would assume. Yeah, it's it's microscopic. I mean, what, you know, there's not, a, it, it's a crazy thing to do. It's not a profitable thing to I mean, it's just, We don't have a big kidnapping industry in this country. Mm. Um, so, but but they're incredibly vivid. They're the worst thing that could happen uh, to, you know, it's the worst thing you could imagine. And so th- while the frequency didn't go up, the visibility of them did. And so parents started freaking out and gradually overprotecting. Now, when I was a kid, I remember the first milk cartons coming out with, and the first, one of the first pictures was Aton Pates. Um, and by, by the 90s, these pictures of missing kids were everywhere. They were on electric bills. They were on pizza boxes. And movies, too. There, yeah, it was, th- that's right. There were all kinds of TV shows. And in fact, the crime wave, to the extent that there was a, there was a big crime wave um, in the 70s and 80s, that was actually ending in the 90s. But American parents began freaking out more. So we were afraid of crime inappropriately because it really wasn't a threat to our kids. Um, then there was also... Um, there was also the rise in competitiveness of college. So in the 1990s, especially middle class and above, they got suckered in, taken in with the stupid idea that if you expose your kids to Mozart or to early math classes, that this will give them a head start. And they got it exactly backwards. What kids need to do until the age of seven is play, 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 play. That's it. They don't need math. They don't need spelling. None of that helps. There's research showing Early math exposure doesn't help. What they need is to play. In fact, a report just came out a couple weeks ago from the American Pediatrics Association saying we we need to prescribe a lot more play. We need to let our kids play. So the doctors are now chiming in that we're really doing a number on our kids by depriving them of play. So there's play deprivation. And then there's um, uh, No Child Left Behind really did a number on our kids because uh, that was a further ramping up of the idea that Kids shouldn't be having unstructured time. They need to be cramming for tests, even early on. We now are, we have kindergartners doing homework. It's ridiculous. So the, there's a lot of really interesting stuff there. Uh, sorry to interrupt. One of them is I, I wonder how that also contributes to this need for, and you've already thought of it, I'm sure, this need for an authority figure, this need to sort of um, say, okay, something's not right here. I want to appeal to authority because I'm used to having such structured time. I also want to just mention this. This was also a bizarre thing for me in the book because it seemed so commonsensical. 
This didn't seem like one of those things that we needed to discover through scientific research. The idea that unstructured time is useful it makes absolute sense to me. Yeah. Also, we, we know, at least we've known for a long time, about the placidity of the brain and the way in which I mean, any athlete knows if you learn how to play sport when you're younger, it's much easier to do it when you're older. Um, it, that, 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 it just seems, um, it seems odd that people didn't have that. Also, the, the other point about the anti-fragile and the antibiotic resistance, playing in dirty environments, it seemed, that also seems very sort of intuitive that that would be something that would build your, auto, your, your, your body's well, immune system. For a system. lot of people, I mean, dirt and germs are pretty disgusting and threatening, and it doesn't seem intuitive. But and I, think, I think you're right that these ideas, once you explain them, people get them. Um, and so we're hopeful, Greg and I are hopeful, that once we lay it all out, like, you know, so we know that kids are having a lot of problems these days. The rates of anxiety and depression are way up. The, their, their strength and resilience is way down. A lot of parents are noticing this. Teachers are noticing this. So we're hopeful that there's an awareness that there really is a problem. We've done a number on our kids. We've got to 